Hello flight simmers. Today we're going to be going over the basic controls that you'll find in any general aviation aircraft in your simulator of choice. Whether that's prepared, whether that's Microsoft Flight Simulator X or X-Plane, all of these controls are based on real world uh, layouts inside of the different airplanes that they represent. The functions of each individual control are consistent from airplane to airplane, whether you're in a Cessna or a Piper or you're in a Beechcraft or if you're in some type of a commercial aircraft. They all serve the same function so that they can be recognizable no matter what aircraft you get into. However, they're going to look a little bit different. They may be placed a little bit different on the dashboard in the aircraft, but really they all have the same function and we'll go over what those functions are so that as you transition from the Cessna, which is where most people start their flying career, into other types of aircraft, you'll be able to pick those up readily. Let's go ahead and take a look at our aircraft today. We're going to be checking out the controls of the Cessna 172 Skyhawk. This is by far the most popular, most produced aircraft in gen general aviation history. Uh, this aircraft has more examples still flying than any other airplane in existence. The controls that it uses are very uh, similar to most of the controls you'll find in other general aviation aircraft. They're very simple controls. They're manual controls, analog controls, although the Cessna does have some electronic components like the GPS unit and, of course, uh, the radio and transponder and other things. But we're going to be focusing mainly on the analog flight controls today. Now we're in the cockpit of the Cessna 172 Skyhawk. You can see that we have a very simple dashboard arrangement. On the left-hand side, or the port side, we have the captain's position which is where the bulk of our avionics and controls are. On the right hand side or the starboard side we have our co-pilot's position. If we zoom in a little bit closer to our dash and our controls we can see that the majority of the analog controls are located in a grid type fashion and that's intentional so that it's easy for you to memorize on that grid where the important controls are that you're going to need during flight. It's easy to reference as you're flying around. Sometimes you're in an emergency situation. You'll use that muscle memory to remember where those controls are at. On the right hand side you've got your avionics stack including your navigation and communications radios at the top. We have two types of GPS unit based on Garmin GPS units in the real world. The 530, which is the primary one that you're going to use for flight planning, is at the top with the larger screen. The 430, which is an older type of a GPS unit. Below that we have a transponder, which indicates to air traffic control what your identification is while you're in the air. And finally, at the very bottom of the avionics stack, we have our autopilot, which becomes a very important piece of equipment as we're flying around. If we look down lower on our control stack, you can see we've got our flap controls, which are very important as we come into land and we need to drop flaps and get more um, lift on our wings as we slow down. We've got our throttles, we've got our carburetor mix, and probably one of the most important controls that you'll find on any aircraft, general aviation or commercial aircraft, is the trim wheel. The trim wheel is how you actually trim your plane out during flight so that you're not always fighting the control stick in or out to maintain altitude. Right now you can see that the uh, trim wheel is set to take off. That means that the trim on the plane is set to optimal angle so that as, our, as we reach our takeoff speed the plane will start to nose up on its own. As we get into flight that trim wheel is adjusted so that we can level ourselves out and not spend so much time keeping ourselves level during flight. Let's move into the various instruments pilots use to safely fly their aircraft. While each plane's controls may vary in appearance or location on the control panel, they all must serve the same functions so they're familiar to pilots who fly various aircraft. The Cessna's instruments are a good model of what you can expect in other aircraft. The magnetic compass is vital when you are using autopilot, as well as other precision instruments in your aircraft, such as the directional gyro, which sets your heading. Always start your flight by making sure that the directional gyro, or heading indicator, is adjusted to be in line with the magnetic compass. If you do not, you could be off course by a significant amount, which makes lining up with your destination airport difficult or impossible. 
This is one of the first things I check before moving on to other instruments. Next, let's move down to your heading indicator, which is also known as the directional gyro. This displays your aircraft's heading and compass points with respect to magnetic north when it's properly adjusted with a magnetic compass. Next is the airspeed indicator, which shows your aircraft's speed relative to the surrounding air. This is read in knots or kilometers per hour. This has important markings on it specific to the plane that you're in, such as stall speed, which on the Cessna is the non-marked area below about 47 knots, the never exceed airspeed at 160 knots, and safe flap speed marked between 47 and 95 knots. Airspeed is vital to know for the operation of any aircraft and will be different for each aircraft that you fly. The attitude indicator or artificial horizon shows your plane's relation to the horizon. This is how you tell if your wings are level and your nose is pointing up or down. This is one of the primary flight instruments you will use in flight to determine the status of your aircraft's path through the air. Let's move to the altimeter which measures altitude. The small hand indicates thousands of feet where the large hand indicates hundreds of feet. On our altimeter, it reads 4,720 feet, which can be verified by checking what altitude the airport is on a chart. Knowing your altitude is vital to not only crashing, but sometimes pilots get confused when reading this because it's not showing altitude above ground level. It shows altitude above sea level, so be very aware of the terrain below you when planning a flight. In the 1960s, as a result of numerous accidents in aircraft, an improvement was made to the altimeter with the introduction of the small window showing oblique lines which warn the pilot that he or she is closer to the ground. These lines disappear at higher altitudes. Next is the turn coordinator, which indicates your aircraft's rotation around the longitudinal axis. This indicator will also have markings that indicate a standard turn rate for that aircraft. If you exceed that turn rate, you're putting more stress on your aircraft and might damage it. The VSI or variometer or rate of climb indicator helps to determine how fast you are climbing or descending. This is a vital instrument when matching a glide slope on approach or ascending to your cruise altitude. Climb too fast and your aircraft might not have enough power to maintain itself and stall. Descend too quickly and you could damage your wings or other components. The rate of climb indicator measures in hundreds of feet per minute and if it's at zero it means you are in level flight. The VOR indicator is short for very high frequency omnidirectional range and is a traditional navigation aid which allows a pilot to tune in on the airport's instrument landing system or ILS. The ILS helps a pilot to line up precisely on the center line of the runway and descend at the perfect glide slope in order to land safely in less than ideal weather conditions. ILS landings are used at the very end of an approach to get the airplane lined up precisely. ILS landings are great to practice in the flight simulator during good weather so when you start flying in rough weather, you have the knowledge to make seemingly impossible landings in low visibility situations. Check out my other video on ILS landings for step-by-step -step instructions on how this works. The Course Deviation Indicator, or CDI, is found in most training aircraft. In the CDI instrument, the radial indicator is a needle which is clearly visible at the top of the instrument. If the location of the aircraft is left of course, the needle deflects to the right. If the location of the aircraft is right off course, the needle deflects to the left. If the location of the aircraft is on the right course, the needle is centered. We will cover the CDI non-directional radio beacon and VOR in more depth in another video that goes into the flight director systems located on the far right of your Cessna's instrument cluster. The non-directional radio beacon is another type of navigation aid, which we will cover when we look at the course deviation indicator and the VOR. Now you should have a good basic understanding of the analog indicators that are found on a Cessna 172. As we said in the beginning of the video, most of these indicators are used in a variety of aircraft. 
up to and including commercial aircraft. They may look different and have different placement on the dash, however their function is the same. Get to know your aircraft and when you move to other aircraft, you will have an easier time understanding how to fly the new aircraft.